Thanks so much. Thanks for the invitation, Jonas and Biostock, to be here to talk about um, how we think about the markets. So I'm, I have an agenda. I'm going to talk about my healthcare team, which is uh, you know the support we have um, uh, to do good research. Uh, what I like and why, zooming in on the Nordics, of course, which is of most interest for you. We're not going to talk about Uppsala, but we're going to talk about a market update, including equity capital markets. And I'm, I have the nightmare of having 40 slides with me, and I have less than 20 minutes. So we're going to do some of these fairly quickly. But just a background, so, so I'm a biologist by training at of Stockholm University. I did 18 years as a sell-side equity analyst. Uh, most recently with Danske Bank, I then joined the um, buy side and managed a global healthcare fund for Swedbank Gruber for five years. Uh, and then I returned to the sell side uh, as an equity research analyst and leading uh, the sector team at Hannes Banken as of February last year. Um, you know, uh, the elephant in the room, why do you return? It was great fun. Um, um, I met with more than 500 companies over five years. I wasn't a superstar, but I left with four stars in Morningstar when I left, and pr things progressed during the period. So I think, you know, obviously doing what you do and learning and taking, uh, getting experience from what you do is, is good. And I also collaborated with a lot of different portfolio managers at Ruber, uh, 30 plus of them, anything from global mandates down to unlisted private companies uh, to get a better insight to. Um, you know, what the different uh, portfolio managers uh, that I now is serving uh, around the globe, uh, what kind of challenges they face. I also sat in on the uh, nomination committees for three different uh, companies, uh, which helped me uh, get insight to corporate governance and what, um, you know, a, a strong owner can do. On my team, as of October last year, we get Andy Kranz to join from ABG, runs, um, you know, medical device and tools and supply. Uh, an economist out of Lund, and then Susanna Quickburner joined me out of Karolinska Institute, where she has a PhD, and most recently she joined from Nova Holdings in Copenhagen, where she did VC, and also has in this experience from Roche and Bristol Myers Squibb. So we cover 19 uh, Nordic healthcare stocks today. I'm not going to stay here. What we think we bring to the table when we speak to, uh, you know, in typical um, institutional investors, although you know, also we, we entertain the private banking side of the bank. Uh, um, and when we think about how we compete and what we may bring to the table that is different than others, uh, we have a science background, we have sell side experience. I've been on the buy side. Susanna was in the industry, she was on VC, I was on the nomination committee, and I also sit on the board uh, of a private company together with the well known uh, serial entrepreneur Thomas Eldred, who founded the Resi Farm, which was taken out by Equity here a few years ago together with their two co-founders. And, and what on, uh, why, why on earth are you doing all of these things? Well, we think the more tools we have in the toolbox uh, to understand what's going on uh, around the companies, around the industry, uh, around the boards and what have you, uh, the better speaking partners with our different uh, stakeholders we can be. So some of the flagships events we do at Handelsbank that we're particularly proud of is the Nordic Small and Mid-Cap Seminar always run in June, uh, 100 companies, 20 healthcare companies over two days. And then we have an annual Life Science Innovation Day where we gathered 12 uh, Nordic CEOs, uh, a guest speaker, Michael Dalston, uh, the chief scientific officer of Pfizer, joined me for a Pfizer chat to talk about innovation, which is really a, a, a word we put at the center core of everything we do here. So with that intro, so what I like and why. So I'm probably going to stay more on what I like. So innovation is the starter word. Uh, with innovation, you get price, pricing power, you get a valuation that doesn't stop at the peer group, but typically you can uh, get a standard deviation or two above the peer group. Management in particular, the smaller the companies are, the more critical it is to have, have experienced people. Some of the areas we, we do like, uh, orphan drugs, oncology, I'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, well controlled, double blind, randomized clinical uh, data. Uh, even if small data sets is always the preferred thing here, right? And then uh, in contrast to many others, I think you know being contrarian at the right time can be um, value creative. Uh, spec pharma roll-ups, uh, I do think uh, has a role to play. Uh, imaging and digital enablers and then tools and supplies uh, going for the uh, gold diggers can be good, but risky. Going for those who sell the tools that help those gold diggers can be uh, just as uh, you know prosperous, but with less risk. 
So, uh, you know, obviously smaller biotech continues to have a good uh, situation. So this is uh, the portion of drugs that comes uh, from emerging companies, mean, meaning smaller uh, biotechs out of the ph pharma pipelines. So it's gone from half to now roughly three quarters. Uh, and uh, that is to face the uh, known productivity issue that the uh, pharma industry has, uh, which uh, you know has been illustrated by many. Here is an example from UBS, and possibly an improvement the last decade or so, al although there is a lag in data and analysis of these long-term data sets, but some people would argue that that's an improvement. So obviously, the pharma is continuing to look for opportunities, which is helpful for the smaller companies with pipelines, but may lack uh, infrastructures to sell and market th those drugs. And innovation has improved, but continues to be in great need. This is one way of illustrating that. So this is the five-year survival date for uh, uh, data for various different cancers. The, the, the vast majority, uh, almost all, uh, has moved in the di right direction compared to the 70s, compared to the most recent analysis. But of, of course, we have far to go towards the 100% where we all want, uh, you know, the cancer patients to have a uh, promise of, of getting to. So there is more work to be done. Innovation is becoming more competitive, though. So this is an analysis that looked at the time from the first in-class to second in-class launching. So some of those classes to the left are all familiar to you. Statins for uh, cholesterol lowering, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Whereas uh, more recently, uh, some of the more well-known biological, uh, well-understood mechanism actions like PCSK9, CAR Ts, PD1. I, uh, and etc. The, the second follower is, is is much more rapidly launching these days. Obviously, that puts extra pressure on being, uh, you know, diligent and fast to the market. Importance of management. So I've, I've illustrated and I've spoken publicly before about I think the value Pascal Sorio brought to AstraZeneca. It's it's more tricky for me to talk about smaller companies because then you know that can be more politically difficult. But for, for a large company of, of the size of AstraZeneca, seventy thousand plus um, employees, um, what he inherited back in 2012 when he joined, when everyone would agree, I guess, who followed the industry, that it, it was a company in the bottom quartile. And 10 years later, uh, all of those would agree it's, it's now the company in, in the top quartile in terms of productivity, R&D, innovation they bring. Uh, value creation at last uh, is, is quite fascinating. But of course, you know, the, the smaller the company is, uh, the more important this is. Orphan drugs is an area we continue to like. Uh, one of the reasons is, of course, that pricing remains very attractive. So the fewer patients you have, the easier it is to get a very, very high pricing. Here is probably Altomiris or Soliris by Alexion that AstraZeneca then acquired uh, on the top, on the uh, y-axis, above $500,000. But as you can see, there's a big number of orphan drugs that are highly priced because the uh, regulators and payers have agreed that we should uh, stimulate drug development uh, for these rare uh, diseases. Oncology, I said, so obviously a lot of uh, capital going into the cancer field. So this is the VC funding going into different uh, therapeutic areas. Obviously the cancer field is standing out here uh, compared to the direct cost it has for the uh, U.S. healthcare system, but on the other hand, you can see here a study uh, the last 10 years of uh, approvals in the U.S. Uh, a third of those for oncology drugs. Obviously, your odd, odds of getting approved is is perhaps um, uh, higher. Um, I wouldn't bet all my savings on Alzheimer. I didn't look at the agenda, Jonas, but but uh, I may run the risk of uh, getting into problem here. But uh, I think you know the phrase "not bet all my savings" uh, is perhaps the disclaimer. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping for for uh, humanity, so to say, that obviously we're going to get something that is disease modifying and helpful. So this is, but but to have the backdrop and the odds uh, when you invest in different fields. So this is uh, the blue dots are all terminated Alzheimer projects the last 20, 30 years and the few orange uh, are basically products that have been approved. And you can see that the odds of succeeding is, is, is not uh, terribly supporting, supportive. Uh, so keep that in mind at least, and you know, spread your bets. Uh, and of course, with biology and imaging, um, our disease understanding of even um, sinister-related disorders is improving. Illustrated not least by companies like Roche, which are very bio biology driven now in the field of Alzheimer, Huntington's disease, um, multiple sclerosis, uh, etc. 
and, and, and the same goes sort of say for, for gene therapy. So it's tricky to know exactly who of all these projects is going to win to the market. Uh, so this is an illustration of the close to 1,000 projects that are in development. And again, back to what I said earlier, sometimes it's better to, to um, you know, invest in a company that it supports all of these companies with tools and regions and instruments, uh, manufacturing. Uh, so you get exposure to this super trend, which everyone can see that's in place, but uh, you're not betting on exactly who of all these is going to win, because obviously we know from historical stats that not all of them will. Um, so summing on the Nordics, so I think you know it's always good to start with a bit of perspective. So you know what have Nordic companies historically been very good at? So obviously we're overrepresented on drug development. We have Astra Lundbeck, Nova Nordisk, and we had Pharmacia. Uh, you know not many regions have uh, so many uh, proven. Uh, companies, at least from a historical perspective. Also, orphan drugs were overrepresented. Swedish orphan, Europe orphan, that few people remember that Recordati once acquired, and Wilson Therapeutics that was taken out by, by Alexion mentioned here earlier. Tools and supply companies will also have a long history. Pharmacia Biotech, G Healthcare, Bicor, it was taken out. Uh, Pyrosynquisin, which was sold to Kaijan, and we still have a few, of course, still operating in this field. Uh, including uh, Genovis, Biotage, uh, Arctic Symes in the Nordic region, if we expand our scope. Imaging is also uh, you know, an area where we're historically very strong, in, not least in Linköping, where we have Sectra and Synthetic MR. Uh, but it's also not a, a, co a coincidence, I think, that uh, Electa in collaboration with uh, Philips was the first company to get an MR uh, integrated uh, linear accelerator approved for treatment of uh, oncology patients. And I think it's also important that we, we operate in, a, in an environment where we also have a lot of uh, tech entrepreneurs. Here I mentioned Spotify and Klarna, but you know, everything is getting more and more digitalized. So I think that uh, both the entrepreneurial culture, but also tech experts in the area uh, certainly helps. And then, you know, uh, so again, maybe this is, uh, you know, something that uh, <laughs> should or should not have been on the slide, but at least it's, I, I'm no names are mentioned here. But I think we're, we're sort of, uh, when I grew up in this industry in the late 90s, there were a lot of people who were uh, credited for being with Astro Pharmacia. But that's not, it's not the same as running a small company with maybe 10 or 20 employees. It's completely different. So I think the management teams in general uh, these days are much more entrepreneurial, and they've uh, learned to understand, you know, the, um, the the game in terms of raising capital is your first thing, thing to think about every morning you wake up until you're profitable. And the universities are still doing quite okay. I think Karolinska Institute, for instance, still ranks fairly well among uh, different um, uh, medical uh, universities. So my philosophy, uh, be data driven, uh, look for consistency of data. If you can avoid binary events, please do. Liquidity reasons may hit, stop you if you run a big fund, but if you run your own money, maybe that's uh, l less of a problem. The market is super good at uh, calling bad outcomes and calling stocks down 89%. Good events is typically start with 30% up, and then that can be a starting point of 300% or so. So to mitigate risk, uh, be prepared and do your work before the binary events, but not necessarily bet on all of them. And then, uh, you know, the racy, racy blade models, again, those to sed, se, uh, sell the shovels, uh, in particular if the gross model is high, typically super uh, good business models. Uh, and the smaller the company is, uh, you know, don't forget to look at who's the owners, who's on the board, and who's on the management, uh, because, again, you know, the smaller the company is, the more dependent they are on that kind of talent and experience. So this is uh, pockets of areas of interest, uh, not uh, intended to be complete. There's no recommendations here. We do have your recommendations for the 19 stocks we cover. But again, uh, I want to sort of say to tie together the discussion around areas I like. So innovation, I think names that come up that are strong in innovation, AstraZeneca, Electa, Bioarctic, Ex Viva, Surgical Science. Uh, orphan drugs, we do have Sobe, Vicor, Calidatas, Hansa, Getis Therapeutics. Oncology. Uh, you know, the list goes on, uh, you can read for yourself, so to say, but I think uh, there's a number of at least IDs, and then, uh, you know, uh, as a final point, management may not be top-notch on all of the above, uh, so it's a matter of ticking boxes, and sometimes you won't get all the boxes, and it's, uh, of course, uh, comparing it with the valuation and what's um, uh, implied. So, uh, maybe a final... Uh, run into some of the uh, what's happening on the market then. So after 10 years of bull market or 10 plus years, we finally got to make the bear. 
uh, it's a Fed year. My strategist, Matthias Sundling, always reminds us of uh, the market is going to be dominated by what the Fed does and, and not. And they're obviously now tightening with, with uh, now speculating that the next uh, meeting is going to end up with 100 base points increase, which is uh, sort of unheard of before. And uh, inflation is on every uh, uh, conference call. So this is a number of uh, uh, times inflation was mentioned on uh, standard uh, S&P uh, S 500, which is the large companies in the US, mentioning inflation on their conference calls. Uh, the updated towards Q1. I don't think uh, it stopped there. Uh, but still, what does this mean then for biotech? So I think the backdrop for FDA is still very favorable. Uh, we continue to have a lot of approvals, although this year has actually started uh, slower. And one of the reasons people are interested in biotech, of course, is that we uh, got to know Moderna. I met with Stefan Bansell first time in 2016, way before the company IPO, way before we knew about a pandemic. Uh, but uh, they had a great idea, but it ended up being applied on, um, you know, um, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And uh, of course, you know, if you can find these companies early on, you can uh, create a lot of wealth. Uh, but after a number of monster years in terms of new IPOs, uh, initial public offerings, uh, sort of the music stopped uh, in 2021. And uh, it was probably driven by the fact that we started to see more and more early stage companies. So out of 21 IPOs, 23% were preclinical biotechs. And as you can see, when sort of the window opened, that was between 5 and 15%. So, and you can also see the phase one, uh, so the pink uh, portion of these bars became larger and larger, which is probably a, a, an indication that the mature companies had already gone public and the VC used the window and uh, pushed out their holdings, which eventually meant that we had companies that were perhaps not prepared to be listed. And uh, now biotech is down 70% since the peak and not since 2003. We've had this many stocks in the US, which is one measure. I'm sure we have a similar situation in other regions where companies actually trade below the cash they have on the balance sheet. So again, we've had uh, even in the uh, financial crisis back in 2008, 2009, we were not even close uh, to this situation where we have right now. So uh, this uh, final slide from me, and I almost made it on time. Um, you know, keep in mind, October is typically a tough month uh, for the stock market. So although uh, there's been a rally up until recently of biotech in the US since June, I'm not sure we've seen the final trough. Maybe we at least we go revisit where we were before. So don't be fully invested. I would at least not be in this market. Midterm elections is typically quite important to understand what's going to happen on the uh, pricing side in the US or, you know, um, in terms of new uh, uh, legislation uh, coming through. And of course, we have the presidential elections 2024, but that's a bit, still a bit time out. Inflation, people have been speculating inflation is going to roll over. Yesterday, we had a yet again a sort of negative surprise uh, with a higher number than the people were, market were hoping for. And you could see the correction the market did. Uh, Fed actions, Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which is basically a new drug reform uh, for pharma, which has yet to receive uh, any attention almost here in Sweden, uh, which is sort of the first drug reform in 20 plus years in the US. So in summary, what's the summary? Well, I think, you know, stay focused on innovation, innov innovative companies and uh, innovative medicines will always fi find a way forward.